the Juneau World Affairs Council, and the University of Alaska Southeast, in collaboration with KTOO, present the 2019 World Affairs Forum, Modern Journalism, the Role of News Media in a Changing World. In this session, Disinformation, Misinformation, and Fake News, Understanding and Responding to the Challenge of False Information in the Digital Age, Geisha Gonzalez of the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council focuses on defining and unpacking the problem of unreliable information and offers democratic solutions for civil society, governments, and platforms to address this challenge. Thank you. And it is so, it's so beautiful out there, so I'm so glad that you're here to spend time with me to talk about, uh, well, not one of the most pressing challenges that we face today, disinformation. Uh, Carl, thank you so much for organizing this, and thank you to DayWAC for, for bringing us here. Again, my name is Geisha Gonzalez, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Eurasia Center at the Atlanta Council. Let me unpack that. Eurasia, for us, means the post-Soviet space. So I cover Russia, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, and other post-Soviet states. That is my portfolio. So obviously, I'm sleeping really well today, <laughs> um, every day. And the Atlantic Council is a Washington-based think tank that focuses on the transatlantic alliance. Uh, it's bipartisan, so we don't take one side or the other. And we actually really believe that we're stronger with allies. So we do spend a lot of our time uh, re reaffirming to our allies in Europe, particularly today, that we are stronger together. Um, I'm not a journalist. I'm not a media expert but I've been observing the Kremlin tactics of influence operations for the last six years. Um, so my recommendations are not gonna be about what journalists should be doing in today's media space. Instead, I will be talking about the conditions by which journalists have to operate today, the actors that are exploiting the freedoms that we enjoy as democracies, namely the freedom of expression and freedom of the press, and also try to unpack some solutions as to how we can address or look at this challenge. So how did I get here? Um, in 2014, Vladimir Putin sent troops to Ukraine and illegally annexed Crimea and started a war in Ukraine's east. And then he lied about it. First, the Russians were not there at all. Then it was Russians that were on vacation. They were the ones that were there. Um, after that, it was the Ukrainians. It's Ukrainians that are trying to fight for their freedoms. No, it was the US that paid for the protesters to be out in the streets asking for democracy. No, it wasn't us. And in today's age, it's astounding that a major power could get away with lying about having military presence in an independent country in the heart of Europe. And that's where disinformation comes in. Now, I want to unpack and give some definitions because I will be walking back and forth on some of these. There is propaganda, and we know propaganda. Propaganda is not new. Information operations, particularly by governments, have been used for as long as you know, history has been around. I think the most recent one that I can remember when I was first looking at this was the, the propaganda campaign that um, the UK government launched during World War I to get soldiers to sign up for the troops. Mm -hmm. I want you to join His Majesty's Army, right? All the posters around, and now we have Uncle Sam. I want you to join the army. Um, so propaganda really was, it's really the positive campaigns, sometimes negative, that are meant to make you believe something, right? They want to mobilize you around one idea, one action. And so that's what propaganda is in our space. Then there's misinformation, which is the unintentional spread of false information. This is something that you know my grandma is very famous for in our family chat groups, uh, where she sends us articles that she's found that are clearly false, and then it suddenly spreads. She doesn't mean to deceive us. She actually believes that this is true. So that is misinformation. Then there's fake news. We don't use fake news in MySpace, because fake news has now become the weapon, the verbal weapon, that is used against journalists around the world when you just don't agree with them, right? The sky is blue, fake news. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's really sunny outside, fake news. 
right? Uh, so fake news, it, it doesn't really have the same effect that it, it used to. We can't talk about fake news because it's political now. So we use false information in MySpace. And then there's disinformation, desinformatia. That's the uh, term that Joseph Stalin coined as one of the tools of an influence toolkit that the Kremlin employs across the world. Disinformation is the intentional spread of false information. Disinformation is not meant to make you believe in something, it's make you, me, meant to make you believe that nothing exists. It meant to, it's meant to blur the lines between reality and fiction. It's meant to make you question and confuse you. Disinformation campaigns are so effective because they don't have to be false. It can be true information that is misallocated. It can be a real flood, videos of a real flood that is misallocated to a different country and suddenly you think that there are floods happening. That's disinformation. It's meant to confuse you. It can be real protests of Black Lives Matter um, activists misallocated in a different city, right? Um, it, can be, it can be anything that is true, but it is employed intentionally to deceive you. Now, you probably know about disinformation and the Kremlin's influence operations because of the 2016 election. Now, disinformation campaigns are not new, and we say that, and it's, it's, every time that we say that, it's like saying, well, war isn't new, right? Uh, but disinformation campaigns are not new. What make it different now is that disinformation campaigns have more room to be planted in our ecosystem, in our information ecosystem. It can go viral. It can be targeted. So um, I often like to tell this. I am, well, I'm a young woman in my 30 to 35 age range. I like Beyonce. Uh, I always aspire to exercise, but I never do. So I spend a lot of time looking at exercising clothes. I am a politically aware. I am a war historian, so I like tanks. Um, and so if somebody wanted to sell me a message now, they could just say, I want a 30 to 35 year old woman who's Latina, who likes Beyonce, who's politically aware, and we're gonna send her a message. And that message is Beyonce is running for president. <laughs> and I will share that because it fits me. It fits my version of reality. Of course Beyonce is gonna run for president. Super qualified. Um, and, so, and so disinformation campaigns are real things. So like it takes real truths about your life and it plants it to you. So there is a myth about, well, only stupid people fall for disinformation. No, not one bit. Everybody can fall for false information, right? Disinformation campaigns don't discriminate. Disinformation campaigns are effective because they get at the cracks of our societies. They get at our divisions, they're targeted. Um, and so there isn't just one person that is meant to fall for disinformation. Uh, it's not just the US. So when I think about the Kremlin campaigns in the last five years, one of the most wonderful things that I got to work with um, was at the Atlantic Council. And it was about this idea of how do we prove that there are Russian troops in Ukraine's east when the main aggressor is denying the fact that they have troops there. When they've employed their entire media machinery to articles, so not just, not just uh, Facebook and Twitter, not just Russian Facebook, VK, but that are also able to do RT, TV articles, or TV uh, segments where they're talking about there are no Russian troops. It's Nazis and fascists in Ukraine that are doing this. Um, Sputnik when they're able to game the Google searches that make sure that the top results are not the New York Times or Washington Post, but Sputnik and RT telling you about what is happening in Ukraine. Um, when they're able to do all of this, how do we prove reality? How do we prove reality? And that's one of the most challenging things that we have in this space. So, of course, a lot of the Russian soldiers that made their way to Ukraine were 17 to 18. And I still remember my first trip abroad, um, jumping over the, the transatlantic ocean, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, going to the UK, being in London, Buckingham Palace, selfie. Um, I'm in Westminster Abbey, selfie. Uh, London Bridge, <laughs> so many selfies. Uh, so 17 to 18 year old soldiers 
in their first trip abroad, Ukraine. You know, uh, uniform, great guns, tanks, selfie, <laughs> right? And it was all publicly available. So we were able to use open source research, track the photos, mm. and map Russian soldiers from Russia all the way to Ukraine on top of their tanks with their guns. And we said, here are the Russian soldiers. But we cannot do that for everything, right? Because the wonderful, and, and by wonderful, I mean awful thing about disinformation is that it appeals to our emotions. Like we're so emotionally charged these days, and that's what you know, uh, Dr. Noon was talking about, right? You know, we are we're in a very polarized era in our history. Not that it hasn't been before, but it, it feels hyper polarized because we also have different platforms, different ways of communicating. We're more interconnected, um, and so when we think about how do we prove something that is true to someone who emotionally believes that the false information is what's true, it gets really challenging. And so when we think about the work that we do at the Atlantic Council, we are bipartisan because we don't wanna say you're stupid for believing that. Like here's some, here's some truth for you. Two plus two is four, not five. Um, and so when you know disinformation, unpacking it, understanding it, um, it, it's, it's truly become one of the most challenging things to do in a democratic society because you also have to be within democratic norms, right? You can't just say, we're gonna remove all the false information. We're gonna tell platforms they need to like shut down all the sites. We're gonna stop circulation of Breitbart because they're spreading uh, propaganda. We're gonna close down Fox News because they keep lying. We cannot do that because we're a democracy. Russia can do that. China can do that. Saudi Arabia can do that. But we cannot. And so when understanding the challenge of disinformation, what do we do? How do we start thinking about? How do we unpack the truth? The truth lies in understanding how we address the challenge of tobacco addiction. In 1964, the Surgeon General came out and said, smoking can lead to cancer. For a month, people stopped smoking. They're like, okay, we're gonna slow down. Then tobacco companies came out with light cigarettes, the healthy version, right? You saw the kind of like, get the light. Um, and smoking continued. Smoking is as addictive as disinformation is. It's the same emotional attachment, right? It makes you, like for those that smoke, okay, I will do another example. So, uh, disinformation is a lot like burgers, like Big Macs, right? It's juicy, it's delicious, you crave it, you consume it, and you know it's not the best kind of information, not the best kind of food, but it's tasty, right? MIT launched a, uh, a study last year where they found that labeling information as false made people click on it five times more than if it was not labeled false, right? Because if it's a sensational headline, you want to click on it. I mean, tell me that Meghan Markle and Prince Harry are having twins, click. <laughs> I mean, like, I need to know, right? And so, the, and so when you're using information that is true, right, that exists in reality, you plant a little lie, you click on it, right? And you know it's the... Uh, not probably, like Jennifer Aniston is not pregnant. <laughs> you know, it can do, like, eh, but I wanna click on it. I wanna know what they're gonna name the kid. Um, and so all of these things, you know, like, and so all of these things, so you can see why it's, it's, really, it's really effective. And we're fighting against emotions, we're fighting against um, a business model, too. So when we think about the responsibility of journalists in this space, in the responsibility of journalists to report true information, to report facts, to be in the front lines, we forget that the, the demand for true information is the same demand that we have for broccoli. It's not great, right? And so if you're trying to make a living, particularly in a space where virality and breaking news is the name of the game, it is very challenging to force people to consume broccoli over the cheeseburger. And so, 
I mean, ain't it fun being a democracy? <laughs> um, <laughs> we all have various opinions. And so, you know, our bad actors, Russia, China, Iran, are able to use this. So they use the freedom of expression that we have. They use the freedom of press, where you can publish something about Jennifer Aniston that may not be true, but you know, it's still your freedom of press to do it. Um, where you use divisions that already exist in the society, where you use the polarization between Black Lives Matter and uh, Blue Lives Matter, where you use uh, women's right to choose versus, you know, uh, um, pro-life, uh, when you think about those divisions that already exist in our societies and when you plant little half-truths in it to further divide us, disinformation campaigns are an effective tool by foreign actors to destabilize democracies. Because we are eating ourselves within, right? And any solution that we come up with has the risk of making us become them. And we must not become them in order to beat them. So I go back to the tobacco example, right? Cigarette is bad, cigarettes are gonna kill you, you should stop. No one stops, tobacco companies start doing the light, healthy cigarettes. It was not until civil society, governments, and the private sector actually started working on this that we had any changes on the consumption of cigarettes. And everybody played their role, right? So it wasn't up for the government to say, you should stop smoking, we're gonna stop selling the cigarettes. But it was their role to say, we're gonna regulate you. We're gonna say, it's higher taxes, so if you want to kill yourself, you're gonna have to pay for it. It's about labeling, right? So labeling the box, labeling alone in, in disinformation is not gonna help us, you're gonna click on it anyway. But the label plus the higher uh, expense will curb your habits a bit, because if it's more expensive and then you get to see a long, uh, you know, a, a, what is it, it, like a smoky lung every time that you buy a cigarette or a label that says smoking kills in really big, bold letters, um, it kind of starts curbing your, your consumption. But then again, when you have restaurants that say you cannot smoke inside, you have to smoke 20 feet away, it's not about eliminating cigarettes altogether, it's about saying, like, if you want to do it, now you have to go really far away. When we think about that in the information space, we think about Google not making Sputnik and RT the first results, but putting them for page three and four. Everybody knows that after page two, everything is useless. Um, and so, and so, it, it is, it, so it's about thinking about how do we do that in a disinformation space, right? And until we start working on that, and I'll stop here, we're not gonna find a way in which democratically we can address the challenge. Now, you can tell that I move around a lot. Um, I, I'd like to have a conversation. So I'd like to open up for questions. And you can ask me anything about disinformation, about Kremlin operations. Um, and yeah, go ahead. OK, you said that foreign actors are yeah. working to destabilize American democracy. Whoops. You yeah. said that foreign actors are working to destabilize American uh, democracy. How about U.S. oligarchs? And uh, you mentioned Breitbart News and uh, it, its uh, main voice came out with basically a manifesto trying to destabilize our government. Mm -hmm. And uh, so mm -hmm. <laughs> with uh, oligarchs or corporate actors, uh, they may get richer by destabilizing a democracy that has uh, uh, regulations to protect the environment. What do you think about that? I will, say, let me, I will take a step back and say foreign and domestic actors are seeking to destabilize democracies worldwide and make it broader, right? Because the Kremlin wasn't just trying to attack the United States. They actually employ their entire influence toolkit in the UK. That's why we have Brexit. So if you think about the dark money that went through it, the leave campaign, the lies, uh, the disinformation campaigns about the kind of immigration that the UK was gonna receive, the disinformation campaigns about you know, how much money actually went to the EU versus uh, the NHS in the UK. Um, the Kremlin was also in Catalonia, where they pushed different narratives there around their referendum uh, against the Madrid government. Um, and of course, in Ukraine, it continues still. And that's not, that's not the only piece. When I think about what we should do to address the challenge, I try to be as actor agnostic as possible because it is Russia today, China tomorrow, Iran, and then our own government. 
So if we continue to think about the, the actor itself, we run the challenge of just doing you know, one a piece instead of becoming a resilient society where we are actively voting knowingly who we're voting for, where we're actually questioning more about the information that we're receiving, where we're actually pushing platforms to disclose where the money for political advertising is coming from, where we actually ask the government to make sure that there are independent oversight boards that are able to regulate some of these pieces. So yes, there is a lot of money in this business. It is the reason why Google does put the more sensational results up. The algorithms um, push the sensational content up higher because it means that you're gonna spend more time there. The anti-vax content that we see on YouTube, for example, is meant to be there because then it takes you to the flat earth theories. And then it takes you into the moon landing never happened. And then suddenly you're in a rabbit hole. But all those hours that you're spending on YouTube mean more money. So there's less incentives about you getting the truth. So when we think about, yes, the money, yes, the oligarchs, yes, the Russians. And by Russians, I mean the Kremlin, because I do believe that the Russian people should not be blamed for the problems of Putin and Kremlin and the ol oligarchs that rule that system. Um, then you know we, we really have to focus on like how do we become more resilient? What are the tools that we can push for that will allow for the content not to be as damaging to us as it is? I hope that answers your question. Yes, hi. Hi. I'm, I'm interested in in the the Ukraine. I confess I don't know a whole lot about it, but um, regarding Eastern Ukraine, when you talked about the Soviet invasion there, and with tanks, how you identified these people using their own selfies on their tanks. Mm -hmm. It seems like there should have been hundreds, everyone's got a phone with a camera these days, so there should have been hundreds of Ukrainian photos of these very tanks. Mm -hmm. It would have far more veracity than mm -hmm. having to go, you know, to identify mm -hmm. it in a roundabout way. No, so it, so not a roundabout way. There is something about being the victim and then having an information operation out against you and then you trying to prove that you're an innocent person. Um, Monica Lewinsky, for example, right? Like if you are the victim in a situation for you to be shouting out, I am a victim, I'm being invaded, which is what Ukraine did, is not as effective as US organization comes out and says, I just found all of this on Facebook and it's Russian soldiers. It was Russian soldiers themselves taking selfies of the, their presence there. Russia just passed uh, last month legislation that now blocks the use of cell phones for Russian soldiers in operations because it continued to come up in everything that they did. So it had to be, and then you have Vladimir Putin a world, like a, a major power leader saying, we didn't do it. Just like he's telling Trump, we didn't do anything, yeah. Yeah. right? And so when you have the, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's messed up, isn't it? Like, even in this explanation, I'm like, right, it seems so crazy that we had to go all these different steps to say like, there are troops in Eastern Ukraine and they're still today. Like there's a hot war in Ukraine's East today. Um, because you have a leader saying, we're not doing it because you have the entire media operation that he runs and funds saying, we didn't do it. It was a Ukrainian fascist uh, because you have allies saying, well, they are saying they didn't do it. And also like who really wants to get in, into it? Well, where is our, our major media even commenting on this um, hot war? If it's a hot Where's war. our, well, now they're in a better place. In 2000, so when we, when we first launched our report, so it was called Hiding in Plain Sight, right? Because they were right there. Um, we, once that rolled out, you have more journalists going out. So we had some vice news journalists that also started taking the same trip that the Russian soldiers did. Um, and, and you have more and more awareness about the challenge that Ukraine is facing in the East. But once that was uncovered, it also meant that Western leaders needed to make a decision about how they were gonna respond, which isn't really popular when you think about all the different conflicts that were going on at the time in 2014. We were still dealing with whether or not we intervened in Syria. We were still, I mean, in Afghanistan, Iraq. You know, just thinking about all the different conflicts, there, isn't an, there was an appetite 
to also sell it to your people that, well, the Ukrainians were just invaded. People are like, huh? The Soviets, right? Um, and we need to act. What does that look like, right? In 2015, once that was uncovered, we see that the Western leaders have to react. It is, it is a country at the heart of Europe seeking its own self-determination to become democratic and European, and we cannot turn our eyes away from that. Uh, because that, you know, that anybody that aspires to be democratic should be, should be um, helped. And so we launch our sanctions program against Russia, right? So we still have sanctions against them because of their illegal annexation of Crimea and its continued war in Ukraine's east. Um, in November, right after Thanksgiving, Russian uh, boats, ships actually attacked Ukrainian ships and kidnapped 23 of their Navy officers. So we still, we're still dealing with it, right? And we just up sanctions. Um, so yeah, we have to go around about, it's, it's, it's the word of a world leader versus the people that he's victimizing. And that's often not the loudest voice. I'll be your moderation. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I know, I know. I don't like exercises, so like this is. <laughs> hey, I wanted to thank you for your, um, your distinctions between those terms, misinformation, propaganda, disinformation. I mean, that's really, really important, and it is uh, yeah, the fake news uh, embodies it all, but there is distinctions. Um, the other thing is uh, people don't really understand the degree to which, and I'll be talking about this, that, that there is no major media anymore that is not grappling with social media's uh, uh, bizarre zigzags and, and all the emotional levers being pulled used through the use of data is really what we haven't seen before. And um, so I just want to commend you on your talk. Thank you so much. And I will say on data, and data, it's still a very untapped subject among researchers in terms of, you know, of course, you've always seen, well, I shouldn't say you've always seen. Have you ever found yourself searching online for a pair of shoes? And you find a really fabulous pair of red shoes, maybe not you, gentlemen, but who knows? Um, and it's red shoes, and you're like, oh man, but they're too expensive. And then you find it in the next pages. And then it follows you and you think it's destiny. And the more that you see it, it's like, well, well, if it keeps popping up, it must mean something. And then you buy them. Uh, we still don't know the, ex I mean, I can search Athens and then suddenly the flights are coming and I'm like, yeah. maybe, maybe. And Athens and now oh, packages to go to Athens. You're like, oh, okay, maybe I can do this. That, we are still completely like we're just at the tip of the iceberg in terms of how data is used to message to us, to manipulate, manipulate us. Um, and so watch this space because I think a lot of the regulatory norms that we develop will have to also deal with how data is used by different platforms, who they sell it to, who they share it with. Um, and I think that's gonna be the next biggest challenge. It, it already is a challenge, but it's gonna be the one that we, we will have to watch, along with how AI tools will use that data, um, not, hopefully not against us, but yeah, close. We have one here, and then we have one right behind. Um, thanks for that, that example. Uh, we recently got a uh, echo Someone had said it's listening all the time, so we started talking about hot tubs. And so <laughs> we're waiting to, to see if we get those messages on our uh, Facebook feed. So, um, but what I wanted to ask you was, what are the regulatory mechanisms that the Atlantic Council is recommending? Mm -hmm. So when we're thinking about regulation, and I know, um, when we're thinking about regulation, we have moved away from content regulation because we don't want anybody to be the arbiter of truth. We don't want Facebook to be determining what is true and false. We don't want the government to be determining what's true and false. So we've moved away from content and narratives. Instead, we're looking at tools. And by tools, I mean algorithms, right? How are algorithms being used to push information up and information down? Right? So a lot of the platforms are actually content editors by just pushing the algorithms that will make you 
um, that, that fit what you, what you would be interested in, right? Um, so we're thinking about that. We're also thinking about having the platforms themselves come up with common um, terms of use. That are, and so thinking about the fact that we don't have common definitions on hate speech, on violent content, on harmful content, like that is not the same platform to platform, right? So that, what that does is that it prevents Facebook from taking down something that is violent and then telling Twitter, hey, saw something violent, take it down. Because Twitter's policies may not consider that violent content, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so we are thinking, like, is there a way that we can have not government regulate, but actually government force platforms, and not just the big platforms, also the medium and startup platforms to come together, to come up with common definitions that are part of the terms of use so that when, um, and I don't know if this is controversial, but Alex Jones is posting videos about conspiracy theories about um, Newtown, that each of the platforms can communicate and take it all down, right? Pro stop the virality, have common definitions. Um, you know, conservative media can't say that one platform is being biased over the other. They can all come together and say, this is part of our common definition and he violated it all, right? So you take it all down. Um, we are also thinking about using some of the already existing legislation to try to regulate some of the platform content. When I say that is using FEC's, so the Federal Election Commission's regulations around political advertising. If you buy a political ad on television, you have to express where it's coming from, right? So you say paid for by Da, 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 for America, or pay for by da, 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 pu for puppies, um, and so you know on TV this exists. So we ought to think about transferring some of that legislation into the social media platforms across the board, right? Um, we're also thinking about, and we have recommended and pushed for, and successfully have gotten um, the foreign uh, foreign ah FARA Foreign Actor Registration Act. Foreign Agents Registration Act, sorry, um, which was actually established in the 1930s to combat Nazi propaganda, mm -hmm. right? And so that, what it does is that any foreign agent needs to be registered as a foreign agent. And that now includes Russia today, so RT and Sputnik. So it says paid for by the Russian Federation, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not, it doesn't stop them from being in the airways, which again, I am against, even though spewing hate left and right, um, and it's because it's not democratic. But instead, we're labeling and saying, like, consume it if you want, but the Russian Federation wants you to see this. Um, and, so, and so we're thinking about existing laws that we use radio. I mean, if you think about it, it's radio, television, newspapers. All of these needed to be, um, there were new mediums that then needed to be regulated, right? If you think about World of the Wars, uh, Orson Welles, mm -hmm. right on radio, people go outside, oh, like the war is happening. Now we have something that stops us from thinking that Game of Thrones is something that is happening in real life. Uh, and so, so you see, like, you know, it, it, it changes. So we just, we have the legislation. We just need to start adopting it. Um, and that will also be hard because the platforms have gotten so big. They have, I mean, I'm in Washington, so, you know, you're all the lobbyists in the world. Right? They can afford it. And so it's, it, this is where civil society and individuals are really important because they have to push platforms to be more responsible. And we need the government to fund more civil society that actually knows, so civil society in the technology sector that actually know beyond how to restart your computer, which is what our senators were asking Mark Zuckerberg, yeah. or how do you share a post on Facebook? Um, that's not the thing. The Russians infiltrated Facebook. Um, like, that, those are the questions you should be asking. So, so investing in civil society and technologists so that they can give us better solutions that we can then push the platforms to adhere to. So that's, you know, that's a, like a, a tenth of my, my, my work. <laughs> and I have, I have the gentleman behind you and then you. Sorry, Carl. <laughs> okay, you were you you alluded to the fact that if somebody finds something on the internet that's titillating, they're much more likely to click on it, yeah. re retweet it, and yeah. do all these other things. Yeah. There's a ver there's a really good example of that that I heard some some time back. There's a group of people who are unabashedly liberal who established put a website up that said 
at the top of it, it said, everything you, hear, you see here is fake. It is not true. And then they put really outrageous stuff trying to ensnare people that are doing really outrageous, saying outrageous things to get them banned from Twitter. But they, an example of one of the things they did is they said, Hillary Clinton and, uh, and, and Michelle Obama were invited by Trump to a signing ceremony and while there gave him the finger and then they showed a picture of two women one, the stand-in for Chelsea Clinton was Hope Hicks. The stand-in for uh, Michelle Obama was Omar Asso Man Manigault. And that particular item got retweeted just massively by, by Trump people, even though, you know, well, people on the right. I won't say Trump people because maybe they're not. But anyway, people on the right. It just got massively retweeted, even though it was clearly identified as being false. And I found that very was interesting. Was it flagged as false? Yeah, yeah, they flagged. I mean, the, the banner at the top of the website, I, I didn't go there, but it, the way it was described was the banner at the top of the website said, everything you read here is false. This is a satirical website or something like that. Yeah, it's like people, um, I don't know, do you know The Onion? Uh, oh, I'm familiar oh, yeah, with the it's onions. It's like people sharing the onions. They're like, this is happening. And you're yeah. like, oh, God, what are we going to do with you? <laughs> what are we going to do with you? Yeah. But I mean, and, and, and it's true. But not only, so I will say this, um, because you alluded to Trump people. Right. Um, and then, you know, just people. Uh, well, pe right? People yeah. in general. I'm not. Yeah. I, when you think about retweeting, when you think about, um, you know, getting seeing something that is shared massively, mm -hmm. it's important to also understand that there is a business of bots Right. And trolls. Yes, yes. And that, and so this is where the content, editing content piece is actually really tricky. Right. Because it is hard to distinguish between a troll, meaning somebody that is paid to amplify content, yeah. and a real person that holds those beliefs. Right. And so it could be 5,000 retweets, but 500 of them may be like the real people that actually believe that's true. Right. And like it fits their belief. Yeah. But the other 4,500 are yeah. trolls that are paid to believe that. I think these folks probably didn't care. I think they were interested in identifying yeah. just agents. And if it, whether, it's a per, whether it's a person or it's a bot, if you can get it off, knocked, off, knocked off of Twitter, then you've done something. Yeah. Yeah. Though, I mean, we've had, uh, so in the UK, it's funny things happen when you try to call out bots and say, this is a bot, then the bot comes out and says, no, I'm a real person, and then they do an entire TV circuit, 15 minute, like, <laughs> like I'm not a bot, and the government said I was a bot, and here, so this is, this is one of the challenges that we face in, in these eco chambers. Yeah, but I have. Well, this goes back to what you were saying before and taking it one step farther. The last speaker we had for JWAC was from the American Promise. He was the head of the American Promise, which is to try to get a 27th, I believe, 28th Amendment to our Constitution to take money out of elections and politics. <laughs> Do you think that's going to work? <laughs> Should it ever get passed? Well, I mean, this, this goes outside of my expertise, but I will say that, because I'm, I'm, not, I'm not watching US elections, I'm not watching what ought to happen, and so anything that I say on that particular uh, string of thought would be, um, would be personal opinion and not expert opinion. In my expert opinion, I have seen how dark money infiltrates political campaigns across Europe. Right, um, we you know mentioned oligarchs earlier. We have an entire network of oligarchs, uh, uh, you know, Russian oligarchs that actually infiltrate money into political campaigns, into parties. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Marine Le Pen yeah. of the National Front, right? Uh, she had several loans from Russian banks, which are not really loans from Russian banks, mm -hmm. right? It's Russian money. Um, Salvini, the Prime Minister of Italy, had. Russian loans, too. Uh, Aaron Banks, who was the leading figure of the Leave campaign, so the main financer of all these messages uh, in Brexit, he was also with dark Russian money loans. Um, so when I think about removing money from political campaigns, I think about cutting some of the influence that foreign actors 
that funnel their money have in the political discourse where they don't belong. So would I be in favor of something like that based on what I know about the Kremlin tactics? Yes. Do I think that we have currently the political will to pass something like that? Not in this Congress. Um, so we'll see. But you know, it, 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 it's undeniable that money, money is one of the greatest drivers of some of these campaigns that are damaging. Um, yeah. We have one here. Can I add real quick? We did invite the Onion, but they were unavailable. <laughs> <laughs> and Game of Thrones season eight premieres April 18th. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> Sorry. Oh, th Sorry. Thanks for a great talk. Just uh, real quickly, uh, in following on the, the idea of money and campaigns, uh, uh, Jimmy Carter uh, has said that we don't have a functioning democracy. And he, his comment was mainly dealing with the plutocracy and the influence of money and, and corporate influence. But uh, coming on your talk, if... Um, and thank you for uh, uh, talking about misinformation and disinformation. And we're pretty familiar with uh, the tobacco misinformation, disinformation campaign. And then some of us who are climate activists are really aware of the climate misinformation, disinformation campaign. What if, uh, so those are specific things. What if in the situation we're in right now, uh, the whole of the fourth estate is in question? in that uh, if uh, we rely particularly on uh, electronic media or digital media, and it's essentially become uh, a fountainhead for disinformation, misinformation, uh, in, uh, ruled by marketing to sell me more shoes mm -hmm. or whatever I like, maybe I like fishing poles, <laughs> uh, then uh, you know we're getting around to how can you have a functioning democracy if uh, even people who pay a lot of attention can't figure out what's true. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of my question. Of course. Can we have a functioning democracy with uh, a debilitated fourth estate? Yeah. So I will say to you, let me, I will unpack um, your comment. Thank you for that. So on the one hand, I will add that when I was, th when I, you know, express regulation on platforms, there also needs to be regulation of the advertising agencies and the advertising sector, because the same tools that are used to spread misinformation, disinformation, are the same tools that are used by advertisers to sell you things. Yeah, right, right. But like it's the same. It's like having, you know, uh, uh, paying people to comment on a product online. It is, you know, getting your ad in the most. Um, most popular newspaper, most popular website. You want to have, just like you know, with the ad uh, ad uh, industry for television, you want your stuff to be placed in the most high, like high demand um, website. And so, what I will say is the demand side. Like, I think we can have a functioning democracy, um, but it's up to us too. So you can be the most well-educated person, and you can be very thoughtful about everything, but if you're still clicking on the Jennifer Aniston is pregnant, <laughs> then you're part of the problem, you know? <laughs> like, if you're still, because it's, it's a demand thing, and supply exists where there is demand. Like, and so, yes, you know, we think about education being very key for, for children. I don't disagree, but I think children are smarter than we are. I think children can see BS right away, um, but I think we need to start empowering kids to be more outspoken, to, to call out adults too when they're, when they're consuming crap. Um, and, and yeah, I, I, I agree, but you know, we, can't, we can't shut down outlets or bloggers or Braveheart, even if we think and want to rip our heads, you know, our hairs out for, for everything that they do. Because at the end of the day, we're a democracy, and democracies take work. Yeah, and, but democracies take work. It's hard. It's hard to be in a democracy. It'd be great if, if you know, shut down the internet and just nobody gets to send any more pictures um, or share anything on Facebook. That would be easy. So everything, you know, it took 50 plus years to curb tobacco consumption, and you still have people that go out and buy cigarettes. So we're not going to be able to save everyone either, right? So I think. Um, it, it's up to us, each individual. I think it's about empowering the next generation, about still focusing on education. I think it is about going out and voting and demanding better of the people that are, are you know, are our leaders, right? Staying at home and voting because you don't like the, the other option and think that everybody else will take care of it is not, not the most effective way, if we saw from 2016. 
um, so I think you know it, it's 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 a challenging time, but. Our, I, I really, I'm one of those people that really believes in our institutions, and I believe if we just get it together, go out and vote, demand more quality um, information, empower our children, continue to push for more education, I think we're gonna be okay. Um, and that may be kind of crazy, but I, I actually think that, that that will be the way to go. Yeah. Any, yeah? And I hope that answers your question, mostly. Thank you. Uh, you just spoke about the next generation, future generations, and what's your sense about um, progress we're making in uh, giving the next generation um, good tools to work with in terms of digital literacy and awareness of these issues, uh, critical thinking and so forth. Do you see any promising practices across the country from your perspective where we're making progress on that front and giving that next generation the tools they need? Mm. I think that one of the most chal challenging things about talking about media literacy, digital literacy for the United States as a whole is that we have not yet agreed on creationism versus evolution. <laughs> <laughs> like that, that critical thinking in Mississippi will be different than that in Illinois. That we don't have a central education system that can mandate a curriculum where we push for digital literacy across schools that you have private schools, you have charter schools, you have public schools. Like it's, you know, a lot of folks that are working in this space of disinformation will point to Finland and say, look at Finland. They're doing so wonderful. There are so, and I'm like, we can't all be Finland. <laughs> there is seven million of them. And they're, it's a homogeneous society. They're not that diverse. They, you know, the, the schooling system is well invested in. It's a priority. You don't even start school in Finland until you're like six or seven. Everything else is painting until you get to like that point, you know. And like, you know, I just think about that being used in the U.S. and I'm like, oh my god, like it's just, it's not, it's not functioning. So, and so here is where I think that it's, it, it will still be civil society. So I think that it won't be so much the educational system. Yes, we need to invest. Yes, you know, those that can should push for um, critical thinking to be applied across the board. I do think that state universities should mandate critical thinking at the beginning of their, their bachelor's degrees, but that's three credits, so the universities would have to eat up that cost. Like, I, I still pay student loans. I know, I know it's hard to like say, I'm gonna pay for these th three credits to be more critical. Um, and so, you know, it, th there is some wiggling there, but I think civil society, there are a lot of organizations, and I'll say First Draft News, um, I say Digital Forensic Research Lab, that have de developed, um, you know, quizzes and games and like things that, that are free and available. So we just need to like figure out how do we actually push that out to more schools, to more kids? How do we make it cool? Because um, cool is everything. And, and actually have kids do that. But I think the challenge is that for the United States, our, our education system is, is uneven. And that's, that's the most complimentary thing I can say about it. Yeah, yeah. and so that, that's the challenge. Not to be doom and gloom on that. Yeah, we have one more question, and we have one here, too. I hope I'm not getting you down. I, I, we're going to be okay. <laughs> yeah, the, um, the conversation between uh, uh, Americans ab about what's going on between the Israelis and the Palestinians has changed radically in the last five years because of cell phones. And because of what people are, it, and not because of the big media, but because people can look at what's happening in real time on the internet. And the US State Department has adopted a definition of anti-Semitism that designates seven out of 11 examples of what anti-Semitism is as um, criticisms of Israel. Mm. And so if we adopt this model, that, and, and so anti-Semitism is hate speech, if we adopt this model of we're going to just take down hate speech, then that conversation could just stop. Uh, so do you, do you talk about that at the Atlantic Council? We talk about, so I will say, I mean, Israel, Palestine, this is <laughs> a lot, right? It's, it's, it's heavy, it's, it's complicated. A lot of the recent commentary has been about nuanced comments versus outright 
uh, comments that are anti-Semitic. Uh, and so I, I, I follow the conversation because there's so many different layers that are that, that are more about opening up conversations than they are about attacking one another, right? But there, there are interests that like mandate so that some of these gets inflamed. When we talk about hate, and this is why, when we talk about hate speech, we ought to be also talking about those marginalized um, communities, right? So when we talk about hate speech uh, against trans people, we ought to be talking about to trans people about what it, what, you know, what the kind of comments that they're getting. It, it's going to be a bigger process, but it's about actually bringing all the different people at the table, coming up with common definitions, understanding, um, and then seeing not content specific. Eh, but actually having common definitions about what qualifies within Windows. And then deciding, is it a muting of accounts instead of taking down? Is it saying like, you know, we're warning you because this actually violates this piece and having a conversation with the folks sharing it versus taking it down and saying, You're, this is hate speech. Um, you see, there, there are a lot of intricacies there, but we, we ought to be bringing in those marginalized, like not marginalized, but you know, those communities that we want to protect into the conversation about how we define how they want to be addressed, how they don't want to be addressed, um, the kind of attacks that they face online, mm -hmm. and, 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 and then go from there. Not fully satisfactory. <laughs> well, I, I guess when, uh, well, for example, today the, the Israelis have tanks massed on the Gaza border because yeah. tomorrow is, uh, is the anniversary of um, of the Great March of Return, the first, mm -hmm. the first march there. And so when you, when you look online at, at what people are saying and what people over there are saying, even the Israeli papers are saying, compared to what you see here, it's, it's 180 degrees out. And the Israeli Ministry of St Strategic Affairs is spending tens of millions of dollars every year to manipulate media in the United States, and mm -hmm. they don't have to register as foreign agents. So I guess my concern with, with saying we're going to take down hate speech is how do you define hate speech? Yeah. Who makes that decision? Yeah. I still think, so I will go exactly back to my answer, because what well, you're, I mean, even that, that is reporting, that can be misinformation, um, but that is not, does not qualify as hate speech as such. That qualifies as a misreporting, that uh, qualifies as, you know, for example, the the parallel is like the amount of money that Saudi Arabia spends to kind of clean up their image after the Khashoggi killings. Um, it, it isn't, it, it, there's a really fine line there. Um, and I don't think that we want to regulate that content. What we want to do is protect, like, you know, hate, it's, it's, so these are two separate things. Hate speech is different. Showing tanks in Israeli border is not anti Semitic, nor it, does that, so it's, it's, it's just a different, it's a different content question, right? And like hate speech qualifies as something that is actually aggressive. Uh, violent content is something where you're, you know, for the New Zealand mass shooting, that's violent content. Um, when you think about harmful content, you think about um, home remedies to cure cancer that are not true, that, that qualifies as harmful content. Tanks or misrep, like, you know, that, that doesn't qualify as these three things. We want to move away from regulating um, content like that. Thank you. Of course. I think we had. We have a minute for question and answer. <laughs> Great. Um, so, going back earlier in your talk, you talked about the emotional draw that social media plays on for us. And I think one of the other big things is the short span of attention, which our shortening span of attention. So, if I see a headline that I kind of like, you know, I'm scanning through, I'm just gonna believe it and move on. Mm -hmm. I'm not really gonna investigate that. And that seems to be really something that is drawing us into these you know, fake news belief patterns, perhaps. And did you also know that once you see something and learn something, two weeks after that, you forget where you learned it from? So then if somebody comes to you and says, did you hear that Jennifer Aniston is pregnant? You're like, I saw that somewhere. <laughs> yes, yeah, I saw it. So yeah, and, and of course we do get a lot of information. How many times do I refresh my Twitter feed to see what, what else is there, right? Um, I scrolling through news, yeah, I, attention span, emotional attachment. Um, it's what we remember, what we don't. It's what we put value to and what we don't. Um, so that's why, like, you know, we can put all the tools together, we can regulate platforms, we can demand more of governments, but at the end of the day, it's us. It's the demand side. 
and, and I, you know, sometimes I feel unfair by putting so much onus on the consumer of information, but that's the only thing that we can control at the time. Uh, RT's, RT's um, slogan is question more. <laughs> Which I just love, because it's like, it, you know, it's a question more, but watch RT. Uh, so, but, but it's true, question more, question more, uh, because that is the only way, and, and you know, try to, try to eat some broccoli from time to time. And on that perfect note, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> that was Geisha Gonzalez talking about disinformation, misinformation, and fake news, understanding and responding to the challenge of false information in the digital age. Her presentation was recorded on Friday, March 29, 2019, at UAS in Juneau. As part of the Juno World Affairs Forum, Modern Journalism, the Role of News Media in a Changing World. Produced by KTOO and the Juno World Affairs Council in partnership with the University of Alaska Southeast. With support from AELNP, Core Alaska Kensington Mine, Dreamhost.com, Hate and Associates, Sea Alaska, and Wasman and Associates. <laughs>